Hello and welcome to the Royal Automobile Club talk show in association with Motorsport. I'm Jack Phillips, Digital Edge of Motorsport, and I'm joined by Matt Oxley, MotoGP correspondent, and Steve Parrish. Multiple national motorcycle champion, uh, team owner, European truck champion, British champion, and broadcaster, so quite busy. So. Jack of all trades, master of yeah. none. I think Matt would agree with that. And you two know each other, you go back quite a way, and... Yeah, we do. I don't think we kind of knew each other in the early days, actually. No, um, because no, you actually, were a bit, I knew. Um, you were a bit I, too I, famous. Well, I don't know about that, but I did know one of your main competitors who didn't like you, obviously. Who was that? Barry Woodland. All oh, right. <laughs> yeah, he would have he would have disliked you because I think you might have beaten him in one of the TTs and did he yeah, beat you? Yeah. You two were kind of neck and neck. We I were. Think, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah. So but I was on the opposite camp actually to Matt in yeah. the early days. And opposite floors. Uh, in Macau? <laughs> yeah, 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 I guess so. There was a lot of rivalry went on there as well, actually. Yeah, yeah. Uh, some sort of a, a drain pipe. Yeah, there was uh, wheels yeah, coming off. Yeah, that's and... the kind of, um, well, we were banned from Macau, weren't we? Yeah. Were you as well? I know I was. Yeah, yeah. well, I didn't even dare. <laughs> oh, right. okay. I was, but I'm allowed back now because it was then Portuguese owned, and once the Chinese took it back, that it, kind it of It started up. with um, me and my teammate, Vesa Kultalati. We, we realised we were staying in the room above... Stavros in the hotel, so we shimmied down the drain pipe one, one, e the first evening, I think, and, and, and stole everything out of his hotel room, yeah. mm -hmm. leaving just his, because it was first practice the next morning, so we thought it would be a bit too mean to take his leathers and helmet, so we left his leathers and helmet, and um, so that was very funny. <laughs> Foolish. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, it was just all very puerile, but there you go, that's what we were doing. And uh, obviously Steve got to hear about it, and... Um, he, uh, we were about to drive off this little island back onto the mainland over this, the tallest concrete bridge in the world. Mm, it was the longest and tallest or something. To get, like junks un to get the junks under it, just off Macau. And uh, we're just about jumping into our mini moat. We all had, every team had a mini moat, one of those little minis, open, open cedar minis. And uh, we were just about to get into the mini moat, and hotel staff said, No, no, you mustn't, but you mustn't drive it, you mustn't drive it. And we said, Why not? And Steve, and presumably his mates, because I'm not sure if he can work a spanner, okay, <laughs> had okay, um, okay. taken every wheel nut off to like the last millimetre of thread. And <laughs> 200 yards later, we, we were, would have been climbing up this huge great concrete bridge to go over no doubt shark infested waters. Mm. And uh, so that was the kind of the sort of so stuff. So it was the hotel concierge I have to go and see now, is it? I've got to track him down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ruined he saved my life. Yeah, because I must admit, I was going to drive back that next day having a look over the edge to see where he was. <laughs> <laughs> was that the same year as the famous fireworks? Do you know, I th it was. It was, yeah, yeah it was, yeah, 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 yeah. That was another situation that sort of went a bit wrong. Um, because the reason it went wrong is I should have been the getaway driver. But the action took place in such a spectacular way that I stayed to look at the action and that's where it all went horribly wrong. And yeah. it also went horribly wrong because the chief of police was also in the establishment that the fireworks went off in and uh, he shouldn't have been in there in the first place, I don't yeah. think, getting a backhander or a fronthander or whatever he was getting. Um, and his, his driver was at the bar watching everything that went on. So it was our own fault, really. It was it's sort of exacerbated by the fact that uh, we didn't drive away quick enough. But it was very embarrassing because I hadn't been long married and I had to phone my wife to say I'm in, I'm in prison for blowing up a brothel. It's kind of an awkward well, situation. How many you got well, out of that night? Well, I, I, I had uh, food poisoning or something, so I didn't go out that night. So I was very oh, lucky. That, at least I got you with my, that then. Because <laughs> my, my team manager was involved and I was going to be with them. I, and we were just going out for a, for, a, for a laugh. You know, it was the last night before we went home and I got Mike, Mike Trimby on the phone at two in the morning in the hotel saying, what the have you been up to? Mm. And I was like, oh, I'm in bed with food poisoning and, and uh, got up the next morning. And the police basically locked us all in the hotel. They wouldn't let us leave because um, Stavros <laughs> had kind of got wind of what was going on. I'd run out the back of the hotel, jumped into a passing cab, got to the, 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 um, the ferry place, the hydrofoil in Macau, and paid somebody double their ticket price to jump on the next hydrofoil and, and uh, scarpered to, to Hong Kong. So basically the police, the Macau police, kept all the, re the whole rest of the Macau contingent, which mm. is probably 25 riders, mechanics, everything, all holed up in this hotel waiting for Steve to, to, to return, return. And in fact, to face, to face yeah, justice. I think in the end, what happened was Mike Trimby negotiated for you lot to go, but the police impounded all the bikes and the cars, all the Formula 3 cars that were probably worth millions and millions of pounds. They impounded the whole lot, let you, let you guys go. They came back, saw me sat at the other end in Hong Kong with my gin and tonic, thinking it was a great giggle, whereupon Mike Trimby insisted and kind of gave me no option but to go back across to give myself up and meet up what with the rest of the threat? 
Well, the fact that they'd impounded all the bikes right, and cars right. and everything else and told me that they just wanted an hour of my time to interview me. Whereupon, when I got the other side, because I'd given my, I'd had two passports, so I gave my old passport that had my American visa in, so they thought they'd got me trapped, but I had my new one to get off the island or to get off of Macau. Um, and when I get back, they'd blown my picture up, which was quite funny. I wished I'd had a phone with a camera with me at that time, because there was a big blown up picture of me saying, wanted, do not let this man off, and I'd already gone by then. So anyway, um, I went back and uh, it was a slightly more serious incident than I'd first envisaged because they tried to charge us for their loss of earnings for that night, which was ridiculous because it was full up. They'd already taken their earnings. <laughs> but they, um, yeah, it all ended with uh, Howard Lees, may he rest in peace, um, my team manager taking the rap because Steve Parrish was too important and the other man involved in the... Uh, <laughs> in the events was Paul Butler, who was team manager of Marlborough Team Roberts at the time, mm. and um, became race director of MotoGP, so it was quite an important guy. So they, you two got to Scarpa, and, and Howard took the rap and spent a week in jail in yeah. Macau, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, yeah, well, we had about three days, they were, though. They were great they, times, Yeah, uh, <laughs> and, and the other fairly interesting thing, I'm not sure where it went to, but the van that was the getaway driver at the time got impounded, and then it missed its ferry going back and whatever, and, and so it was cheaper. We ended up buying the van, so I now still own a van in Macau, I believe, for that particular time. It was something like, I don't know, $2,000 to buy it, or the rental was 6000 so we, we now own a van out there. So whether or not it's still running, I don't know. Well, you can go back now. Yeah, exactly, yeah. They Loud used, back They now. used to give each team a mini moat, which was obviously like these open minis, and, I mean, it's, I feel somewhat ashamed about all the stuff that we got up to, but it just it was just what you did when you were 25 and it was the 1980s and you were a motorbike racer. Have you changed then? <laughs> I haven't. Uh, kind of. Um, and we used to go into these uh, fireworks shops, and there were many. Fireworks were banned in Hong Kong, uh, but they weren't in Macau. So we used to go into these huge fireworks shops and buy these bangers, which would be 300 bangers, all wrapped up in one, which was what they used on this on the big night out. But we used to buy, load up the, 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 the minimotes with these, and then drive around Macau, because there wasn't a lot of racing or practice to be done. It was basically a, a holiday race, really. Drive around in Macau and looking for other teams driving around in their mini motes and then trying to sneak up behind, behind them and, and then come jump out and go past them and light, light this huge 300 firecracker thing mm. and lob it into the... Uh, Back into the mini mode and, and then watch them disappear in, in the biggest cloud of smoke you'd ever seen and, and drive off thinking it was funny. Mm. Um, well, it was. It was very, did. very funny. Uh, yeah. And uh, it was absolutely hilarious. So but anyway, all times in the past. I don't think it goes on anymore now, unfortunately. Well, Rossi this week said being a MotoGP rider is boring now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I well, can imagine it is. I mean, it's very profitable if you're as good as Valentino Rossi and you have great times and you travel around in your jet and everything else. But... Um, you're probably not going to sit down and laugh about what went on during that period of time because not no. a lot does go on. No. I'm from an era when PC stood for pulling crumpet and that's kind of <laughs> how it was then. So is there any, anyone on the grid that you think would? Not anymore, no. no probably not, not anymore. actually. Uh, but I, are they allowed to? This I, is I, the think, I think Rossi still likes a good night out um, but he would have to choose them uh, fairly... You know, I would think during the season they'd probably be fairly rare. Yeah. But he'll he he likes a good he'll stay up all night and get pretty yeah. tanked up and have a good time. You know, and and wow, you know they've got a lot of stress to to get rid of. They they need to do that stuff. Mm. But you know that that's a kind of once in a blue moon now. Whereas back, you know, the further you go back in history, you know, the more often they were doing it. I mean, I, I remember, um, yeah. So Rossi's saying it's more boring because. You know, they don't have a minute to themselves, you know, and I'm not feeling sorry for them, mm. but I'm just saying it's not as much fun as it used to be to be a racer. You right. know, you, they spend more time looking at computer screens than they do riding the bikes. And when they're not, you know, every minute of every day when they're at a racetrack is, is accounted for. You know, in the old days, you'd do practice, you'd have a chat with your engineer, go back yeah. to your caravan, hang out with your mates and have a laugh, wouldn't That's you, right. basically? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then maybe go out and have a few beers that night. Undoubtedly. Corky Ballington said, I always drunk, a, uh, when he won four world championships, had a bottle of red wine every night because he felt he'd be better the next day having slept through the night because otherwise he'd be way yeah. too nervous. Yeah, exactly. So his bottle of red wine put him to sleep and he exactly. felt better for, for having yeah. done that. Because the fact was, and I think probably why we had more fun was because we were more likely to die. So it was kind of living for the moment. And I'm not qualified to say it, but it was a bit like a war zone we were going through in that period where Grand Prix, a lot of them, 50% of them were on road circuits and 
not at all uncom uncommon to lose four or five people during a season and it would be that driving out the paddock and the worst part was seeing the van and caravan still there and the, the weeping girlfriend or wife and everything else that went with it so you might as well live it to the best and of course we had Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday to have fun whereas as Matt rightly says you know Monday would be back in the gym, Tuesday you would see the dietitian, Wednesday the psychiatrist, Thursday the press officer, <laughs> practice, qualify, race Monday, you know, it just goes on and on. It's constant. Yeah. And so there's no time to have any fun. And if you do have any fun, someone's got a phone or a camera with them. It's on social network and you're seen as not being responsible sportsman that you're supposed to be. So uh, they can keep it. Yeah. So back then, were you going around Europe, basically, and coming back to England after every race? Or were you, would you uh, go depended. Uh, you, you, you travelled together. A lot of you. There'd be convoys of trucks and caravans and people stopping in campsites wherever, down on the coast in the Adriatic coast or something like that then you'd probably have to come back to race in England or at Shimei or at Zandvoort or somewhere to earn your money because there wasn't a great deal of finances that went with the Grand Prix. Your, your income came from the international races which were gauged by how well you'd done in the World Championships. So you did the World Championships, got you 250 Swiss francs or wherever it was, which was nothing. Didn't put enough petrol in Barry Sheen's Rolls Royce, I know that. Um, the, the amount that it got, but when you came back, you were given a nice brown envelope with 10,000 quid in it or something to turn up at Brands Hatch at every meeting or at Shimei or international races. So that was where your income came from. It was your kind of lost leader, Grand Prix. Very much so. You had, yeah. to, you had to be good at Grand Prix to get mm. the money to go elsewhere, yep. didn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that, that was, so we did travel a hell of a lot, and, and I would say 90% of us would be in the van with the mechanic, with the yeah. girlfriend, with whatever, towing a caravan and travelled around together and that was how it was done. I spent, I spent thousands and thousands of miles and days and days asleep in a caravan being towed by a van around Europe. I mean, if you said that to someone now, it's illegal, you can't do that, it's dangerous, but you know, I mean, how we didn't end up careering across some field without off the caravan come off the back of the truck, I don't know. I well, guess didn't. what it has done is given you a book's worth of... Yeah, stories. I mean, I could have probably, if I'd have concentrated more, won a few more races and things, but I wouldn't have had a theatre show to travel around the country with or a book to write, I don't think. Or I, I might have done, but it had been as boring as batshit. Yeah. The, the, the other thing that Rossi said at Assen was, was, you know, that racing itself isn't as romantic as it was. And, and, and you know, being Rossi, he's you know, very intelligent and very good with words. And, and that was just the perfect word to use as well, because, I mean, he was talking about just being at races, not being romantic, because you're just working, working, working. Mm. But that's true of the whole thing. You know, back then it was more romantic. Oh, you know, you you, um, you 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 travelled around Europe and you stopped by a lake and you stopped by the beach and and then you went to the next race and 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 the the all the. I mean, it sounds wrong, but all the pretty girls in the town would come to the paddock and they were allowed in the paddock and they could wander around and sit and have a glass of wine with you. And like I say, it was, it was, the, it was known as the Continental Circus and that's exactly yeah. what it was. It because was it a was. circus it was going of people from town going to town. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you went back and in Italy you probably met um, Isabel or something and then you went to Holland and you met whatever. And that was sort of how it was. And an awful lot of riders from my era ended up with wives and girlfriends from mm. those particular countries you Quite often they're nurses that they'd met in hospital. That, that, exactly yeah. that, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Or at someone's funeral or something like well, that. When, but, yeah, when we were traveling around Europe in the 80s doing endurance racing, it was, we, had, we didn't have a caravan, we had a, we had a truck, a big truck that was half converted into uh, living quarters. With a special and, big red diesel tank. Yeah, um, possibly, possibly. Um, and we used to basically buy a load of duty free on the on, on, on the on the uh, on the boat on the boat and and just be dry, run a circular system in the truck. But basically, you sat in the in, in in the back and drank. And then once you got to the front as kind of third kind of navigator, and then you and then the guy in, who was driving would move into the back and start drinking. And then, and then you would by the time you got to the his two hours, his two hours, you were sober again. And, then, and it just yeah, basically went all the way yeah. Yeah. driving for 24 hours. Yeah. And that was doing very that. common. And, it, and, and you wouldn't stop, but no. again. No, exactly. Yeah, there was just no stopping. You just jump drove. out of the driver's seat and someone would hang on the steering wheel and someone exactly, else would slide yeah. back. Yeah, we used to li literally going. do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, no, we did yeah. as well. We had a better, in, in fact, even when I became a team manager, we had another system where we had the, uh, the horse box, if you remember, the uh, Loctite Oakley horse box, which had a mirror behind the driver's seat. And if you started nodding off and you could see someone would, you had to drive by looking in the mirror to see how far you could go, and that would keep you awake. <laughs> so everything would be back to front, and I used to have Terry Ryman, Rob McElnay, and people like that doing it. So you'd be looking in the mirror, and you had to see who could go the furthest by, not, by trusting the mirror, and that would wake you up. Yeah, so wow. Madness, really. Yeah. Mm. Yes. But we're all still here, yeah. ish, yeah. ish.
maybe it's not such a bad thing mm. after all. Mm. <laughs> what Rossi yeah, says. It's, I mean, the, the thing is that it's it's been moving that way forever. It's not something that's just happened recently or just happened. You know, the people I can remember when I started covering Grand Prix as a journalist in the late 80s, journalists then saying it was like John Brown would be saying, oh, it's boring now. Yeah. You know, whereas I thought, wow, this is amazing. You know, and we were still all going out and having a laugh with the riders and, um, and, and doing research recently. You know, you realize that in the sort of 20s and 30s, they were drinking while they were racing. Mm. You know, they would come in for a pit stop and had a, have a brandy. They get refueled and have a brandy and they'd carry on. So, yeah, it's you know, and, and the 60s, 70s, uh, you know, organizers would complain that the reason the riders were getting killed was because was, was they were going out on the lash the night before the race. Obviously it wasn't true, it might have been in some cases. But you know, it, professionalism has a way and money has a way of, you know, if you want to win, you've got to work harder than the other guy. And then so you work harder and then the next guy comes on, right, I've got to work harder than him. And, and, and gradually that just squeezes yeah. everything out of it apart from spending your entire life searching for more performance, whether that's through teaching your engineer, through, through talking to your engineer, through going to the gym, blah, blah, blah. And, and, the, and the bikes are also so much hard, more physical to ride now, They're much harder to ride yeah, because probably. the G-forces and the grip are much, much, much higher than they ever were. Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, you have to be hugely strong to hang on. You know, you think back, Barry, he was smoking what was he on, 20 a day? Uh, 40. 40. 40 a day. I mean, you would not be able to ride a Grand Prix bike on 40 a day now. You know, you would not be able to uh, do but, it. But uh, as Matt rightly says, it was all about weight, really. We just had to be under 10 stone. And I remember not eating. To get, it was like a jockey. Because uh, the bikes, you needed the same. I don't think there was any less skill involved. I think there was no. less physical, as we said. No brakes, no tyres that had any grip and everything else. But also, going on to that matter, is how on earth can we ever find another character in sport in general, not just motorcycle racing, because probably by the age of eight years old, you've been slotted into some academy. You don't have a normal life now. All the people I know, modern day racers, they've not, they've not, I don't know how you got about it, but it was me riding around in a field. I did an apprenticeship, saved up, bought a motorbike. I had a normal life, did all the things, fag behind the bus shelter and stuff like that. So my life was fairly normal. Then I started going out and racing motorcycles. But nowadays, that person is usually filtered out of the normal system, put into an academy, and they don't really have a proper life, what yeah. I call a, a life where you're going to live it to Mr. Average. Um, and, and interesting, you just reading the other day, it was Scott Redding. Couldn't believe he wrote it himself, but he said, I think I'm, a dumb, I'm as dumb as a donut, and I could never hold down a proper job because yeah. I don't know anything but riding yeah. a motorbike, which is kind of sad if his career is about to come to an end because sure. he could easily end up on the scrap I, I do find that endearing about Scott that he's, he's very... Um, <laughs> Open and truthful. <laughs> yeah. Honest. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm not no, sure he should well, be writing his own CV, <laughs> but anyway. But he, he you know, he, uh, there are still characters, but you're right. I mean, but they're not the same as they were before because, as you say, they're, they're, they're not allowed to be because... They've been doing this since they were three, four years old. I think Rossi, without a doubt, is started later than any of the other guys. I think he started racing Minimoto when he's 10, because he'd been doing go-karts before then. But you know, there's not a guy out there who wasn't, I wouldn't think, probably racing by the time he was five. And I've been to Spain at racing schools run by um, Lorenzo's dad, Chicho, and they've got two-year-olds riding around on Minimoto bikes. And, and no. You know, what do you do? You know, no, uh, no, 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 sure. That's why you say you've got to be fit you know, and if you're stronger. Spanish, and, and that's, you know, you look at boxers bronx, boxing their way out of the Bronx or whatever, it's a similar kind of thing. You know, this is their chance. And Reading was very much like that. He yeah. comes from a, you know, pretty, pretty, um, you know, in no, no silver spoons in his mouth, you know, really came from absolutely nothing. And his family decided what his dad and his uncle decided this is what he's going to do. This is his way out. Yeah. Of, 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 of the jungle or whatever you like, want to call it, you know. Yeah. Um, your, your career started with racing as Ago and, and then you ended up into the superstars of the 80s. So did you notice that change? Yeah, I think in, my, in the early period, you have to remember that my mentor was Barry Sheen. So whatever he did, I did. And I did smoke the odd fag and do the odd, you know, naughty thing that seemed to go on. But then I think the Americans turned up and that start, that was probably the first of the changes, even to the extent a lot of people don't often realise it. They say Kenny Roberts won the World Championship. But Pat Hennon was the guy that kind of was the first American that came into, came in to be a teammate. And all of a sudden we saw Pat getting on his 
trainers on and going for a run and <laughs> had a ball worker or something like that and <laughs> what the hell's going on here? So he probably started to make us think, mm, you know, when he, he was leading the World Championship before he had his huge crash in 78 at, uh, at the TT. Uh, so he was probably the start of the changes. It didn't, it didn't come. It wasn't a wildfire going through, but everyone started to realise that Jesus, maybe we should do a little bit more. Maybe we should. And Barry actually, I know he smoked forty fags, but he actually was quite fit, mm. and um, would always tell people he was as fit as anyone and prove it by swimming further underwater and everything else like that. But motorcycle racing, probably more than most sports, it's psychological. And so if you feel, if you're sat on the grid and you felt you haven't lifted as many weights as the next guy or cycled as far as the next guy, you're beaten probably before you start. And that's, that was when it all kind of started to happen. Yeah. So I think probably late 70s, yeah. early 80s, people started to take it slightly more seriously. And then every new guy that came, you know, Kenny was, I, I don't think he was a huge fitness and fanatic, but, but when, when Lawson came, mm. he really upped it, the yeah. sort of fitness thing. And then, and, and then um, when Rainey came as well, and, and then when Doohan came, and they all just up the ante and like I said, you know, if you want to hang with those people, you know, and, and Doohan just took it to yeah. pitiless kind of, um, you know, he, he obviously because he was so badly injured when he crashed at Aston in 92, he had to, you know, nearly lost his leg as a result. He really had to fight physically to come back from that. And I think after that, he just became, a machine. <laughs> you know, Mick just was a machine. He, he, he just worked harder than ever, and he just yeah. wanted, he didn't want to win. Mm. He wanted to just destroy everyone. Yeah, yeah. And, and he knew that just, it was his attitude, his physical preparation, everything, that just when he went to the grid, literally everybody knew they didn't have a chance. Mm, sure, sure. Uh, but actually, in the latter stages, with the amount I've been involved in MotoGP and watching uh, Valentino Rossi come, in the early days, Rossi didn't do a hell of a lot. No, no. He really didn't, because he was so brilliant, so good, and was so capable and so young, it all came quite naturally. But we saw a change when he stopped winning world championships quite easily. Bam, I saw him in the gym in the morning. Um, we had a question, actually, from a reader, uh, a guy called Nick. Um, on those lines, do you think Marquez is the greatest of all time? If not, who? I don't think I mean, anyone. Don't like in... Sorry, to, I, I'll I'll turn to you because Matt hates this question. So. Okay, um, <laughs> I don't think anyone can ever say who's the greatest rider in the world because I don't think you can have any transgressions through uh, eras. I never saw Jeff Duke ride properly. I didn't see Mike Howard ride properly. Uh, I did see Agostini and I saw Barry Sheen. I saw Kenny Roberts and everything else like that. I think you can only ever say who is the greatest of that era. And I would say Mar Marquez, depending where you're changing the era. Yeah. Personally, if I had to see one race ever, I would pay a lot of money to have seen Casey Stoner and Mark Marquez race against one another, because they did cross over. And it would just be who crashed first, I guess. Um, but Mark Marquez, of this last five years, is probably the greatest I've seen, yeah, since Casey Stoner stopped. But that's why I'd love to see that racer, because I thought Casey Stoner was the fastest I'd ever seen. Yeah. Um, a related question, are there any circuits you raced on which are no longer on the calendar but would be enjoyed by today's riders? They wouldn't consider any of the circuits <laughs> I ever raced on um, because they were all ridiculously unsafe. We used to think somewhere like Silverstone was probably one of the safest but we, we sort of somehow managed to blank out that two by two or four by four wooden stakes with um, wire fencing to catch you so you didn't hit the solid arm code. So it just, it slowed you down by breaking your limbs basically so you didn't die but you still ended up with broken arms yeah. and legs and things like that. Um, but I can't imagine that, uh, I guess the one circuit they might have raced at that we did uh, was San Carlos in Venezuela because it was just a ribbon of tarmac in the middle of a desert. Uh, with tin sheds that we used to have to get changed under and it was about 40 degrees. But there was nothing to run into because it was all just desert. But I'm not sure if they would have liked the facilities. There's a good story started. from San Carlos. I think Mick Grant, who's hurt in practice or something, was t carted off to hospital, which, you know, and the hospital wasn't mm. the best in the world. No, and, I went to And it. he sort of, uh, he, um, he got out of there as quick as he could, but he was only wearing his underpants. And he <laughs> had to hit, hit a lift. Back to the circuit, wearing his underpants. Uh, my, I mean, just, that's just how racing's changed. But, but you know? even worse on um, the medical side, uh, my mechanic, 1978, I think, Martin Brookman, big tall Martin Brookman, had horrendous stomach pains, and it was probably something, it almost certainly was something he ate out there because it was disgusting. And he, we took him to the hospital because he was in absolute agony screening. It could have been a kidney stone or something like that. But the doctor, with a fag on, 
and dogs walking around in it, wanted me to pay $500 like, to take his kidneys out. He said he had a kidney infection, I had to take his kidneys out. There's nothing wrong with him. Four days later, he was as good as gold. But they just wanted the $500, and that was, that was, it. That was how it was. Wow. We also went to the circuit one morning slightly early in San Carlos, um, and because my bike had played up the night before, they used to throw us out the paddock at 6 o'clock, and you weren't allowed back in at 8 o'clock, but we went at 7 o'clock to get in there thinking, what, what's the difference? There was a guard there with a machine gun, and we pushed and pushed and pushed, said, we're going in, we're going in, and he went, cocked his machine gun, and we said, we'll wait till 8 o'clock. Yeah. And he would have shot something. There's um, just one last San Carlos story. When uh, Kawasaki entered the World Championships in 1978, they um, turned up, this is Stuart Shenton, and with Court Ballington and all that lot, um, turned up at San Carlos for the first, for the first Grand Prix, or well, second Grand Prix there. First of 77. Yeah, yeah, so the second Grand Prix there, and the, went to the hotel. The next morning went to the airport to, um, to collect their bikes, went to the customs and so on. And uh, the people said, no, your bikes never arrived. And they had a, um, a guy, kind of a Kawasaki employee, to look after them. He said, I think I might know where your uh, bikes are. And this is all completely true. Stuart Shenton, mechanic, told him, you know, God's honour and all that. Uh, so he says, I think I might know where your bikes are. I know where your bikes are. So he's back in the car, reaches under his seat, gets a gun out, or gets a pistol out, sort of makes sure it's got bullets in it, puts it on the dash. And uh, Stuart says, is there going to be any shooting? And uh, he says, well, there may be. And off they go, down the back street of um, San Carlos, uh, sl spinning into this um, depot, big depot, with uh, this guy waving the gun out the window, saying, give us the bikes, give us the bikes. And, uh, and it, was, it was the Yamaha importer. Uh, and, th and, they, and they had t hidden the bikes. They'd stolen the bikes, obviously paid the customs people, and stolen all the factory Kawasaki's, and hidden them in this thing. And, and you know, would they have been found otherwise? I don't know, maybe not. And they got the bikes back. But funny enough, the, 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 the Yamaha Importers was owned by the Ippolito family, and, and um, Mr. Vito Ippolito is now president of the oh, FIM. Yeah. So. Venimotos it <laughs> yeah. was, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, we're actually, funny enough, you should say that, we did exactly the same with the Yamaha team bikes. I remember Barry giving 200 Bolivars, which was 20 quid or something, to the customs guys to make sure that the Yamaha team bikes were way, way at the back. And they didn't get there until the night before practice. I know they lost a day trying to find their bikes. Which again is all coming back to the romance, isn't it? I mean, you know, if you were one of those mechanics or one of those riders, this would have been a complete nightmare. But, you know, what a great story. Here we are 30, 40 years later still talking about it. You know, if, if they'd all just turned up and gone out in FP1 and everything had worked, you know, there wouldn't be a story. So that, you know, motorsport, but any sport, and, and any, any area of life has changed like that because professionalism yeah. tends to suck those things out. And they, 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 it leaves no room for having a good time, basically. No. You know. Yeah. So if we go back to your own career, um, Barry Sheen in your book says that you could have been a world champion, but for the, sort of, I guess, antics off track. Yeah, I'm not sure if I could have been a world champion. I, I think I, when I raced against the likes of Barry Sheen, Kenny Roberts and everything else, I think I probably had their speed at times, but I didn't have their determination. My self-belief was lacking, and I was also allergic to pain at a fairly early age. And, and I really did have a fairly light fuse fitted. I didn't want to stick my neck out. I knew my limitations, and I could beat Kenny and beat Barry on the day, but I couldn't beat them for a championship. Uh, and I think people saw that in me and I didn't get the bikes that they got. And that's a very easy excuse to make, but I think I've come across a lot of very, very talented riders over the years. But if you don't apply yourself correctly, you don't necessarily get the equipment. I was a reasonably good motorcycle racer that didn't have enough self-belief and determination. I think that's the lacking. I think my natural speed was there. Um, and I was very proud to finish fifth in the World Championship in 1977, bearing in mind, this sounds a bit like Wayne Gardner, doesn't it, making excuses and things, but, but bearing in mind that I didn't know any single track I went to. The tracks were sometimes 10 miles long, like the Spas and the Finlands and the places like that. I had to learn them, and I always qualified sort of at least half, three quarters way down the grid and ended up fifths and sixths and everything else. So I was learning the race track as it went along. Um, and I think probably had I stayed with Suzuki in 78, things could have got a lot better, but ifs and buts. But I don't really have any serious regrets about it. Uh, I had an awful lot of fun. Uh, I have a lot of fun talking about what I used to do um, off the track probably more than on it. So I don't know, like, it's, it's rather sad when you have 
people around you going, oh, but if only this had happened and the bike hadn't have broken here and the tyre hadn't have gone off here. And I am sick to death of reading books that are like that, hence yeah. my book is nothing like that. Yeah, well, I was going to ask if you think it would have changed if had you won at Silverstone, but maybe you... <laughs> yeah, I think possibly, it would. for a start, I wouldn't have got fired at the end of 77 because I would have ended up third or fourth in the championship, which would have been the right result, and I think I would have stayed, but they cut their budgets and Pat Hennon had beat me in the championship, so they kept him on, and then sadly he went on to have his big accident. And then in 79, I, they did employ me again, but I think I'd probably missed uh, 78 quite badly that year in a factory bikes or anything else like that. So it would have made a difference. And I could have been quite famous, couldn't I? Br the only British Grand Prix winner, because yeah. no one else has done it yet. No. Um, but that, that's motorcycle racing, isn't it? That, so that one corner, was it Beckett's or Maggot's where you it crashed? It was first, first corner, Cops. So, mm. but co Cops, because Williams crashed after. Yeah, 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 he went to the next corner. Right? Um, you know, you think about that, and that is the way motorcycle, it's a pretty cruel, nasty sport. And, yeah. you know, if you hadn't lost the front going into that, you know, that one tiny mistake, oh, yeah. your whole career could have been completely sure. different. Absolutely. And, and, and that's the same with any number of riders that, yeah. that you know, it's all going pretty well and then something happens and it can be the tiniest thing. You just mm. one second of your career and it changes, it changes the whole, the whole thing. And, and everyone comes up to crossroads in their life and should I take the Yamaha, should I take the Honda, should I go? So those things go on. But I think if you can look back and you've enjoyed what you've done and you've been reasonably successful about it, then it's pointless bitching about it. Yeah. yeah. I read that that year you were riding Barry's championship winning bike, mm. which now is kind of a, that would have been wheeled away into a museum and preserved. And yep. Um, that bike is actually now being wheeled around the UK because it's owned by the Sheen family and it's now doing the rounds, the 76 and 77 bike are doing the rounds. And that was the bike I used, yeah, the 76 bike that he had, which, uh, was it as good as his bike in 77? I don't really know, but it, it did me okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, the, uh, um, talking about what circuits MotoGP riders would like, old circuits now, and although they wouldn't race there because it's too diff dangerous, I'm, I'm convinced that they would all adore Spa. The, the modern Spa. The modern Spa, yeah, oh yeah. The modern Spa, because Red, Redding came there for a, a, a classic event a few years ago and rode Schwantz's RGV 500, funnily enough. Yeah, I was there. Yeah. And you were there. Yeah. And, and, and he just loved the track mm. because, you know, a lot of these tracks now are very slow and, and the riders don't really like slow. You know, you go racing because you like going fast. You don't want to spend your whole time going from second to third, second to third, second mm. to third. You know, you want to be shifting on. Yeah. Yeah. And somewhere like Spa, but, you know, it's, it's way too dangerous. Wait, um, when did I they mean, stop? 1990. So, I mean, you raced on the old circuit. I raced 77, 78 yeah. on the old circuit. And I remember talking to you about that a while back, about drafting on the... Because yeah. it was the old circuit was nine miles long, and, and the average speed was 135 miles an hour. 137. 137, the lap record, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And the bikes would probably do 180. So, you know, that's... You were yeah. flat yeah. out for a lot of the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because... Yeah. Um, and sort of slipstreaming on... Mm. finicky two strokes you're sort of up somebody's mm. exhaust pipes aren't you w yeah. wondering just whether checking they're... if there's a little puff of smoke before yeah. it stopped in front of you yeah. Um, yeah and that I think if, if so, someone asked me my the best race I think I did finish fifth but that was at Spa because I did love even the old circuit was just so special um, with the amount of slipstreaming that took place and everything else. And it was one of my better races, I guess you could say, from having a battle with, I think it was Pat Hen and Johnny Cotto and Giacomo and, Agostini and, yeah. and, uh, and stuff like that. But it was more like the Northwest 200, really, because the straights were so long, you, you, you had to plan. It was like a game of chess, right? I don't want to be at the back. I want to actually be at the front when I go on that straight because they'll pass me and then I'll get back past them. And, then, and so it was like working out th after three slipstreams where you're going to end up by the time you get around to the, the finishing line and things like that. But yeah, I'm sure the riders would have loved doing that. And why is it still deemed to be too safe, uh, too tight It's just tight too now? fast. I mean, there's just, I mean... It's not like runoff as well. Yeah, yeah. I guess. Well, so you're that's what back I mean. It's, it's, it's too fast. Source. I mean, um, uh, Ra uh, Blanchemont, which is the very fast left-hander, is coming back towards the, 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 the end of the lap. I mean, you know, they would be 170 miles an mm. hour um, yeah. there now. Yeah. And then uh, Eau Rouge and Radion, you know, there's not a lot of runoff there. And you would struggle to actually make any. You know, there's a, you know, the Red River, hence a rouge that, that runs through there and so on. So um, I know a lot of, you know, I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's weird because I know a lot of the guys that race there, people like Rainey, Doohan and so on, they actually liked racing at Spa and they loved racing at the Salzburg Ring, which was 
even more dangerous mm, than Spa. Yeah, rock face. Uh, where you're racing at 180 miles an hour up a valley, up the side of a valley with a rock face on one side and an arm car on the other and a, and a pretty much a, a vertical drop and you're doing 180 miles an hour through a, a switchback. You know? mm. and, but the, all the riders adored it because it was just the biggest buzz of their lives, but they knew that they shouldn't be racing there. Mm. So it was a real, quite a weird period when that stuff was going on and, and they were like, you know, they loved racing there, but it was like, no, we've got to stop. Sure, no, it's, it's the old cliche, the, the penalty is greater than the crime in motorcycle racing. Hence, that's why most people in motorsport whatever sport you're into, whether it's Formula One or touring cars, they all watch Grand Prix motorcycle racing. I must admit, I think it, I'm sure it was me that found the, the, the trick at Spa at Le Source, but everyone copied me, when uh, we worked out, or I worked out, that if you went straight up the slip road there, turn around, made out you got a brake problem, you could actually go over the start and finish line, which was after La Source, yeah. about 100 miles an hour faster than you would have done when you came out <laughs> the hairpin. So, and I managed to get it qualified right on the front row, told Barry and he told someone else, and in the end I ended up about seventh because everyone else was doing exactly the same thing. The marshals must have wondered what on earth was going on because everyone would be going up the slip road, looking down at their bikes and things like that, and then there'd be, the marshal would be ready to wave them on, and actually you join the circuit about 120, <laughs> like a drag race. Instead of coming out of the hairpin at, at 30, Five miles yeah. an hour, yeah. 10 miles or whatever it was, yeah. yeah. So that was the scams that you could get away with. And that was probably the romance that Rossi's spoken about. It, it is a lovely word because you could find little loopholes in what you were doing. And to me, my life was about probably blagging your way through your career. And it would be whether it be putting your fan on the ferry at three metres when it was nine metres and then laughing when no one else could get on the ferry because everyone had done the same thing and hiding people in the back and just stuff that went on and, and just having a giggle and finding little loopholes in things you could, because yeah. Grand Prix racing then, there was no rules and regulations, it was four cylinders, six gears, do what yeah. hell you like. And, 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 and as a rider as well, I was speaking to Neil McKenzie a few days ago and he, when he made his debut, his Grand Prix debut at the British Grand Prix in 1984 at Silverstone, and he turned up there hoping to get a ride and they were like no, and he, but basically he had to wait until they were like, oh, until f practice had already started. Yeah, it was after and on Friday practice. lunchtime, they were like, well, so-and-so from Germany hasn't turned up, so-and-so from Switzerland hasn't turned up, so-and-so from Italy hasn't turned up, yeah, you can have a ride, mm. you know, yeah. from Friday afternoon. So everything was just very chaotic and, and, and there was a sense of adventure. You know, just getting to the race was an adventure, wasn't yeah. it? As oh, you said, you know, you know, whereas now yeah. everybody's, you know, they're on their private jets, they're straight out of there, straight home, back in the gym. Yeah, it's just... You know, you can't say whether it's better or worse. But, I mean, the racing now is 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 a hundred times better. Mm, I, agree. I mean, everybody thinks of those great 500 days and so on. But you look at a lot of the races. There were some some great races, but a lot of the races, the you know, the field was split by uh, minutes. Yeah, yeah, minutes. Were, and, yeah. And, and now, yeah. you know, the top 15 at Aston last weekend separated by 15 seconds. I mean, uh, it's. I mean, I, I think it's actually got to the point now where it's almost too close. You know, uh, touching wood here, but you know, when you've got a bunch of riders riding around six, seven together for the whole race, and one of them goes down in the middle of it, you know, you're in the lap. That's when mm. bad stuff happens because you're in the yeah. lap of the gods. You know, it doesn't matter how good safe the track safety is, doesn't ha matter really how good riding gear is. You know, if you get hit by another bike, that's that is a real problem. And and we are at that point where I think they have to go. We really mm. don't want to make it any closer because mm. well, it's, you know, yeah, we, we've introduced yeah. a new danger here. Yeah. It's we've, actually quite difficult to kill yourself in a Grand Prix circuit nowadays unless you get hit by a bike, your bike or another bike, yeah, quite honestly, exactly. because the runoff areas are, yeah. are exactly where they are. Um, but yeah, it, it was so, so vastly different. It would be hard to explain to a modern day rider how it was, I think, because they couldn't imagine setting off from their home in Rimini, could they? And driving up to the British Grand Prix in a van with in a, in you know, their bikes Mercedes in the back. And, and, yeah, with, uh, with no brakes and things like that. It, but that was the adventure. The adventure was also going to the toilet, wasn't it? Because the facilities were diabolical. They were honest to God how we didn't die of some horrible disease because it was just foul. Well, it it was, famously blew up the, uh, the yeah, toilets. Yeah, we did. In, uh, we got rid of the, the toilets. Marching. We did, yeah. We got rid of the toilets in a mattress simply because it was just so vile and disgusting that, that it wasn't didn't seem right, so we went and set fire to him, and that was again. You told me about Philippe Coulon, who was a privateer from around that time as well, and, and at Spa, and I remember doing the 24-hour race there as well, and going for a wee, and you, and you had to throw a bit of money in the lady's bucket to go and have a wee, and, and um, you know, it was a 24-hour race, you were doing that quite a lot, quite expensive. Yeah. But back, Philippe Coulon, who was 
pretty hacked off with doing this, and so he, he, he refused to, to give, give, put money in her back bucket to go into the loo, and, she, and he said, well, you can't, she said, you can't go in, so he just peed in the bucket. Yeah, that was, that was the end of it, yeah, because you don't walk around with a load of money when you're just about to go out and race, you're nervous as hell, you know, it's your yeah, third yeah, toilet. You, you go to the loo so, but eight that, times that before was a kind race. of how yeah. it was, and, and it was dreadful, but we had something to talk about, I guess you'd say. And, and does, the, uh, does the romance still exist, the TT, though? I, I'm not sure it exists there much either, because it's, I think not, the pressure, not as much. The pressure yeah. if you're a top guy, the pressure there now is, you know, back in your day and my day, you would races were won by 30 seconds or a minute or 10 seconds. Now they're won by 0.3 seconds. You know, the pressure on those guys is terrifying, you know, yeah. obviously because we all know what ha can happen over there that generally doesn't happen in MotoGP. Yeah. Um, you know, every time you go to the line in the TT, you, you really do know that you might not come back. Yeah. And, yeah. and that makes the whole thing very different. I mean, you always knew that, but you know, they know that they cannot, they've got to ride 100% of mm. the time every mm. inch of yeah. the racetrack yeah. from the start line to the finish line. It didn't used to be like that. Did no, it? and the bonuses are very important for them and everything else. But I would say that the TT still has an element of that camaraderie in the paddock because people are all sort of wandering around with a bit of time to spare. That's one of the things the TT, you know, you'll have a day off in between and often the riders will be out in the paddock and they'll be having a cup of tea together and, uh, and things like that. So, but then the TT is a tough one, isn't it? Often I, I go there regularly and I get people come up to me and Matt will have had the same. What about if you put Peter Hickman or Joey Dunlop or John McGuinness on a Grand Prix bike and it's hard to tell them that they wouldn't even qualify. Mm. If you could convince Valentino Rossi or Mark Marquez, if you could somehow take an element of their brain out that said this is ludicrous to ride around there, they'd be doing 145 mile an hour lap. And that sounds really I'm not rude. sure about that. Well, but, they'd but, be going a lot faster. Yeah, they'd be going faster. They're going faster. Yeah. But, but you can't yeah, ever it, take it, that If they from. could commit themselves, if, if Rossi decided you know, right, I really want to win a TT. Mm. You know, a bit like sort of um, Alonso going to do Le Mans 24 yeah. hour, it's, it would be the similar sort of thing. I don't think he ever will, but, but you know, yeah, he, he would go fast. If he committed himself to it, um, this is Hickman's fourth year, isn't it? You know? Yeah, um, um, uh, and stunning, don't get me wrong, you know, those guys are, the, the pace he was going at, watching him slide a bite around corners that have got no runoff areas, and the, the ultimate um, situation would be, you know, you could easily lose your life and get, get it wrong. But, and they are fantastic TT riders, but sure. it's, it's a, a difficult thing. one because there's not many people, top line riders, that want to risk that level. Mm. I think when David Jeffries, just before he did a, a year or two in Grand Prix, and you know he was a lovely guy and an amazing, amazing rider. I never, I never raced against him, but I rode him on, on the road with him a few times, and he, he was he was pretty impressive just on open roads. And uh, you know, but when he was at Grand Prix, obviously he didn't have a factory bike, but he was kind of at the back, really, and, you know, there's no shame in that. No, no, shame, no, no, shame no, 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 I'm not, um, not knocking the guys for doing it, but the TT is just so, so unique, um, and that's what makes the TT so special, because the penalty is massively bigger than the crime, and the guys that do it have to be fully committed to doing it, have to want to do it, um, and, and unfortunately, some of them make their li livelihood from it. Yeah. Uh, now, is that unfortunate or not? I mean, they still enjoy doing it. They they're not forced to it. They haven't got their arm twisted up the back. But it has now become another... You can now make a reasonably good living being a road racer. Yeah. You think well, the, whereas you can't being a short circuit no, racer. No, very rare. You know, and, and unless you're... Shaky burn. Unless you're shaky burn. Or, you know, even in Grand Prix now, and well, Superbike, there's a lot of people in there. You probably go at least halfway up the grid uh, in Moto3 or Moto2 before you find somebody that's making any money out of it. You know, and... and that's just the way of the world. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Do you think your inbuilt kind of self-preservation held you back a little bit on the TT? Oh, undoubtedly. Uh, there was no question about that. I mean, I've always had uh, an extra foot or two wherever I went at the TT, and, and, and whenever anyone came past me at high speed, then I used to go, get on with it, you know, good, yeah. good luck to you. Whereas on a short circuit, I'd just dig a bit deeper and have a crack at it. But the TT for me was, I had my pace, um, and, and that was it. And what did annoy me, probably more than falling off the British Grand Prix, I got third place in the Formula One or the senior race and they got disqualified from it. And I, it was one of those odd occasions where I remember coming back over the mountain and someone gave me a pit board or something. 
plus two or what, and I did go faster than I felt I should have done and maybe a little bit of dust came up out of the curves and places Was like it the that. fuel tank size? Fuel, a, a, a alleged, uh, <laughs> alleged fuel tank oversized. I think that might be the first time I interviewed you after that. Uh -huh. I always remember I you saying, I, I don't get mad, I get even. Yeah, uh, yeah. And I don't know how you got even, but you uh, probably did. I, I'm sure I did. not. blew up uh, Vernon Cooper's yeah. caravan. Oh, we know we let his tyres down. We let <laughs> Stephanie, Stephanie helped. <laughs> Stephanie and my girlfriend Linda let his tyres down at uh, Donington Manor. Um, but that was really, really frustrating because I sort of felt as I'd put, stuck my neck out, risked my life, and then got disqualified for something that was completely outrageous. It was 200 cc's too big, and I'd stopped twice and had five litres left in the tank or something like that. I guess rules are rules. And... I think there's a great line in your book um, about the best bit of advice you got given. Mm. Oh, from Mick Grant, yeah, yeah, and it was absolutely true. Grant, he was a bit of a he TT hero, been racing a lot longer than I had, and he was one of the guys when I started doing the short circuits that was my target to get to Mick Grant, and it would have been John Williams and John Newbold and all these guys that have been doing it long and Paul Smart, and uh, get to the TT. And then he kind of had a relationship with Mick, and I said, Mick, look, I'm really struggling. And I was riding a TZ, no, I was on an RG500, and I said, Mick, this thing is locked to lock. I've got the steering damper on full. I've had a handlebar break off because I've been hanging on to it too hard. Selby Strait, which you remember, was just like some kind of wild fairground ride. And the bike was going from curb to curb, and he said, I said, where do you go? What do you do? He said, down the middle of the road, right down the middle of the road. And I said, well, why is it smoother? He said, no, 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 the curbs and the trees are further away. <laughs> and that was quite the simple one. You got a bit more time to jump off or whatever you had to do. So, yeah, yeah that was a great piece of advice. But the TT, I always got on that ferry going home going, Phew. Oh, I think you do. I think every, everybody did. I remember Steve Hislop saying that he, you know, the last time he came down the mountain in the senior at the end of the week, every time, it was like, thank, oh, yeah. you know, yeah. that's it for another year. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even Hislop, who a lot of people would argue is the greatest mm -hmm. TT rider of all time, mm -hmm. uh, just because of his speed and his commitment, uh, even he, it was a love-hate thing. I mean, it can't, you know, it's got to be a love-hate thing. Mm -hmm. And funny enough, I, th I think Hickman r reminds me a bit of yeah. Hislop. When I see him riding around there, just that commitment, Trust in himself. And yeah, and just, yeah, and just that kind of short circuit, because obviously Steve had kind of, was a real short circuit guy yeah. as well, and so is Hickman, and, and, and they bring that kind of, you know, and I wouldn't really call Michael Dunlop a short no, circuit guy, no. so he kind of mm. rides the TT in this kind of TT style, yeah, yeah, fighting yeah. the thing around, mm. and um, Hickman is just, just wonderful to watch. But you know, the just, problem just, is, just, and, and Pete Hickman's well aware of it because he's a smart enough guy, is that the, there could easily be a flipping pheasant sat in the road or a hare sat in the road yep. or uh, someone's left their hose pipe on it, it's running across the track. They're the elements of the TT that you can never take out and, and silly little things can happen like that. So sometimes maybe that, uh, that trust is risky, foolhardy in some ways, I guess you'd yep. probably say. That's I guess the way I saw it anyway. I think your biggest accident though came at not at the TT, but at Donington. Well, yeah, the one that probably was most likely to kill me was at Donington Park, and uh, that was down to Joey Dunlop. It was a, a, I can't even remember what the race meeting was. It was quite a big event, because I know Randy Mamola, Kenny Roberts were in it. Sorry, what? Transatlantic. Was it, tra it was, uh, yeah, probably was Transatlantic, yeah. And, um, and Joey were riding a great big Honda, whatever they were, 998 Honda Britain thing, Mr. Gear coming out the old hairpin. I had no chance, I just smacked in the back of him. Uh, I fell off down the road and Kenny Roberts completely ran straight over the top of my head. I think Randy probably ran over my legs or something like that. I don't know what happened. But, um, and yeah, and that could have easily been, I wouldn't have known what was going on. I didn't know what was going on. I was out for about 10 minutes. Um, and I only recently, and the pictures are in my book, I think, uh, recently someone gave me some photographs of me being, I was going to say, stretched off. I was in a blanket. Someone must have got a blanket out the boot of their car. And Kenny and Randy and two marshals are carrying me off in his blanket. I mean, I could have easily had spinal injuries or, or whatever, but the fact of the matter was, I was just floating along in, someone else, you know, in, in another world. Um, and with this, when it came around, I said to Kenny, what happened, what happened? He said, oh, well, Joey, Mr. Gear, you went to the back of him, you went down, I ran over the top of your head. And, Thanks, Kenny. What happened, Kenny, what happened? I did about 10 times. <laughs> Finally, he gave me the helmet, and there is a big black tire mark straight over the top of my AGV helmet, which he, I put it up for auction, and he still, still owns it now. Uh, I was going to say it's ranch, but I think he sold it. Um, and he still talks about it and says, that's why I'm as stupid as I am, because he ran over my head. But yeah, could, would have been. And he, and he signed it? 
Signed it, yeah, and it went up for auction and he bought it back for something like £2,000 or whatever. Didn't he write something like, I, I was here? I, I was here, yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah. I, ca I caused his issues, I think it says something like that. Yeah. So, but anyway, I was quite proud about it because it meant I was in front of Kenny Roberts. Yeah. That, was, that was my claim to fame. He ran over me. I think we are running out of, bit, bit of, out of time. Okay. So if we just touch on trucks mm. because it's kind of, I think you were a truck driver for longer than you were a... Yeah, yes, and I certainly earning. was more successful right, racing a truck. Um, and, and a lot of people ask the question, how on earth did you end up racing trucks? Well, it was simple, Barry Sheen again, he had a contract with DAF on his bikes, they wanted him to race a truck. The other question is, that must be the wildest thing apart, a motorcycle and a truck. They're actually very similar. A motorcycle does not want to go around corners. It wants to go straight. You have to coax it. You can't slam it into corners. You can't do anything erratic. Well, a five-ton ton truck was exactly the same. Coax it all the way. You have to turn it in early like you would a motorcycle, get some grip, and then drive it through the corners. So I found truck racing considerably easier than, than motorcycle racing in lots of ways, especially because I didn't go to hospital so much. So I think that element, that fuse went up a few grades because I didn't realize, think I was going to die doing it. And so I, I felt I could give it more. But I found truck racing relatively easy. It got harder and harder as I got older and older. But um, in the early days, I couldn't believe how easy it was. And then there were some good drivers in it, a lot of car drivers, Martin Brundle, Stig Blomquist. Um, Abba Drummer. Yeah, you know, Alan Jones had a go at it, you know, and, and none of those guys really latched onto it because I think they were used to lots of grip and they could just yeah. turn it And like you were earning the same money as the D DTM guys at that time? Yeah, right? I was on the same contract, yeah, as DTM guys. It was Which great. Is... It was all my mates. I was packed up and they were still mucking around riding motorbikes and I was getting new Mercedes thrown yeah. at me and free petrol and nice fat salary. It was great. In fact, I had a great scam going because the BP card that I had for 10 years, 11 years, uh, whatever I wanted, just went to BP station, got oil, petrol, whatever, and I used to fill my mates' cars up and then claim their VAT back. So every time I filled my car or someone else's, I used to get 20 quid's worth of VAT back. Excellent. And uh, didn't you um, negotiate a contract mid-race? Yes, I did. It's, um, in Finland, Al, Al Staro, uh, they wanted me to pull over. I couldn't win the championship. My teammate, Marcus Oosterreich, could. Um, Michael Goodside was the team manager for Mercedes at the time. Pull over, Steve, pull over, let him through, let him through with three laps to go. And I said, only if we come to an agreement on my contract for next year, which they were trying to chip me for, and I got it back up and pulled over. <laughs> so I don't think many people have negotiated their contracts whilst on board in a race, as far as I'm aware. Definitely not in a truck, I suspect. No, no, almost <laughs> certainly not. So, um, excellent. I think you have to spend the afternoon signing books. And going I do. Dinner, um, so. my, uh, my book is out, um, The Parish Times. It wasn't the title I was going to choose. It's I a good thought, title, though. Yeah, I guess it works. So I kind of like Parish the Thought, as in Parish the Thought. But, uh, I thought you were going to call it The Village Idiot. Uh, there something. was going to be The Village Idiot, you're right. That, there was a lot of names <laughs> being brandished around. But anyway, The Parish <laughs> Times is out. Very pleased with it. I'd like to thank Matt Roberts that helped me write it and uh, all the people. In most books, you haven't had a chance to read it, Matt. It says, thank you, thank you, thank you. I've gone, sorry, sorry. Sorry, sorry. So everyone I've named, I've said sorry to because I have mucked too many people around over the years and uh, I'm sorry. It's one of those books where you open the page and there's something will make you laugh and something happens on basically yeah. every page. You can just trouble seemed to follow me around. I don't know what went on really. It was sort of a trouble magnet it seemed. But it's not about racing. There is racing in it but it gets me from, to another point of where things went horribly wrong. And lots of great Barry Sheen stories as well. Yes, there is quite a few in there because that was, uh, he was, uh, he was my, 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 um, I guess mentor, I sponged everything up and I'd learnt very, very quickly what to do and what not to do. Um, and I was in his slipstream off the track as well as on it. Excellent. So you have to try and behave here tonight as well at your dinner. So yes, we've got an evening here at the uh, Royal Automobile Club, which I'm looking forward to. I've got Charlie Cox coming along and Susie Perry. So the old kind of the old BBC team, team are all back together again tonight. So I'm sure there'll be one or two glasses of wine and we will pretend how good we were. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Well. Um, we'll be back soon, I think. I'm not sure who the next guest will be, but I'm sure it'll be just as good. I'm, I'm sure it'll be more grown up than I am. <laughs> I couldn't say. <laughs> so we'll, uh, we'll see you then. Thank you, Steve. Thank Cheers. you, Matt. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.